Hi, Mr. Wilber. My name's Daniel. I'm a junior here. Um, and my question is, if you had to choose one spiritual writer, philosopher, or person, and this was the only person you could read from, who would it be and why? Yeah. It, it's awfully hard to make those kinds of decisions. So I'll go ahead and pick one, though, and then I'll add two more to sort of give three, because that'll be a little less confining than just one. But if I were to choose just one, it would probably be Plotinus. Plotinus was somebody who was writing around 200 CE or 200 AD. And it was about 600 years after Plato. And Plotinus is generally and is generally thought to be the greatest Platonic theorist of all time. And so when we refer to the Western traditions, we call almost all of them Neo-Platonic. And that means, of course, it's following in the wake of Plato, but it especially means it's following in the wake of Plotinus. Plotinus discussed virtually all aspects of spirituality, including descent, where spirit comes down a series of levels and results in the lowest material levels of like rocks or wood or those kinds of things. And then he discussed the trip back, ascent, of moving from the lowest level in yourself or in the world and moving back up to the one. And he's a brilliant philosopher and a brilliant writer. And I would probably choose him if I was to choose just one. But the other two that I would mention uh, are from the East. And one is Sri Ramana Maharshi. And Ramana is a very, very interesting fellow. He was not well read or well educated in the sense. But when he was a, quite young, in his early teens, he had a profound spiritual awakening to his true self, which was this pure witness, this one with everything. And he did nothing but write about that state and how you get into that state. And the way that he recommended was simply asking, who am I? And just constantly meditate on who am I? And the reason that that works, the who am I, is that, remember, we just saw that we actually have two selves. We have an object self that we can look at and see and think about and talk about and know. And then we have the seer or the witness of that small self. And to get caught in illusion or to get caught in the lesser world is to identify with just the small self. And to awaken or be enlightened is to become aware of this true self, this true witness, this ever present, all seeing, non judgmental witness. And that you could do, he felt, by simply inquiring, Who am I? Because when you do that, you're looking at your objective eye, the seen eye or the seen ego, but you're seeing that from the seer or the true self, the real self. And so that 
when you ask who am I, and you have this general understanding of the self, then that tends to throw you back onto the pure witness. And when you stay in the pure witness, then you overcome illusion. You overcome all of this sense of separateness and separation um, and all of the fear and anxiety and depression that that world causes. All of that is let go of. And so he became famous for who am I? That's also a Zen koan, by the way, who am I? There's also um, the title of the first chapter of No Boundary, which we read this spring. That's right. Um, and um, because it, it starts to have a fairly profound meaning for you, if you get into the process of waking up, of course, there's waking up, then there's growing up, opening up, cleaning up and showing up. And those are all different types of awakening to a different type of wholeness or greater wholeness in your being. But when you get onto the waking up component, which is the biggest waking up, the biggest unity, the biggest wholeness you can get is from waking up because you become one with everything you're aware of, then that becomes kind of a, an important part of your practice, particularly if you follow Ramana Maharshi. And he has just like 500 page books of just him discussing with people who would come to India to meet with him. And thousands of people during his lifetime came just to ask him questions and just to talk about this process of waking up and how you can do it and what it means. I actually was asked to write a foreword for one of those books, and I was happy to do so. So that's, um, he's a very important person. And in terms of actual practice and what to do to wake up, Ramana Maharshi's got it over almost everybody else. Because just by reading what he says, you can get into a state of witnessing awareness. And that's a very important part of the overall waking up process. Finally, the last book that I would include is one called the Lankavatara Sutra. Now, a sutra is a set of books written in Buddhism. They're Buddhist books, and there are many different sutras. I'd say at least 50 or 60 of them. And they all talk about the enlightened state and waking up and what awakening means and the type of world that you're aware of when you become awakened. Um, and the Lankavatara Sutra is simply one of the very best. And as a matter of fact, the first five heads of Zen Buddhism, they're called the patriarchs, but that was because it was in a patriarchal age. But the first five heads of Zen, as it was being invented, they all handed a copy of the Lankavatara Sutra to their successors. And they said, this book best represents Zen. And so I'm giving it to you as an indication of the fact that you are now the head of the Zen Buddhist sect. And Zen Buddhism, I don't know how familiar 
all of you are with any of these types of um, practices. But Zen Buddhism is well known as being of all the mystical schools the world over, Christian mysticism, Jewish mysticism, Kabbalah, um, Vedanta, Hinduism, Tibetan Buddhism, of all those schools, Zen gives the most emphasis to what they call Satori. And Satori is this experience of waking up, of enlightenment, of awakening. And so Zen is a very good practice if you want to start to get into some of the waking up experiences that you can have. Um, I did probably the first 15 years of my adult life studying Zen. And that's where I had most of my Satori experiences, my waking up experiences. Um, and I'd highly recommend it for anybody. Uh, I then switched to the last 35 years or so of my life is studying Tibetan Buddhism. And that's simply because it's a more complete system than Zen is. Zen really just focuses on Satori. Get this Satori. And that's almost all they do. But Tibetan Buddhism covers the whole gamut of things. It has different mental exercises, different physical exercises. Um, and so it's just a more complete form of spiritual practice. But I still consider myself uh, in many ways a Zen Buddhist. Um, so the fact that the Lankavatara Sutra was handed down by the first five complete heads of Zen Buddhism says that that says something very positive about the Lankavatara Sutra, that this group of people interested in nothing but Satori and nothing but enlightenment or waking up or awakening, that they would pass that book down through five generations tells us quite a bit. It's still a major book in Zen. Um, but that, anyway, so Plotinus, Sri Ramana Maharshi, and the Lankavatara Sutra. Awesome, thank you.